Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Bracken. I'm the president of the Chamber of, uh, State Chamber of Commerce, and I want to welcome all of you to our uh, our virtual town hall meeting today and a conversation with uh, our legislators on the economic recovery from COVID-19. Um, I think, first of all, I want to thank our two sponsors for today's event, AmeriHealth New Jersey and NJM Insurance Group, two longtime loyal partners of both ourselves and the BIA. And we thank you for your support today and your ongoing support over the years and hopefully into the future. Let me just preface the uh, conversation today with um, the fact that I think we all give our governor kudos for uh, his response to our medical crisis, a uh, very aggressive response uh, to a very bad situation, which is now seemingly under control. Uh, however, that aggressive approach did come with a price. The price was a very significant economic crisis that we are now involved in, uh, which uh, Bob, I think we might agree could be a bigger crisis at the end uh, of the day and a bigger challenge than the pandemic medical issue was. We are now in our recovery, and I would say that's recovery with an asterisk because of the restrictions. And uh, I think um, our feeling is that the, that recovery has been slow in coming and is obviously not moving quick enough for any of us. The devastation of the business community has been profound, and it's alarming to me that there is no comprehensive plan to come out uh, that's going to come out to get us back to a new normal, even though there's been a recovery and restart council formed. Uh, what we're hearing is there will be no formal plan coming from that group, which I think is a little disturbing, at least to me. Uh, you add to all that the fact that we have a fiscal uh, crisis within our state and local governments and the combination of the business crisis in the state and federal crisis, uh, state and local crisis uh, really gives us a very bad uh, situation and kind of frames the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing. Uh, I think we all agree that we need guidance, we need answers, we need a plan, we need leadership, and mostly we need aggressive action. The time for action is here. We have to stop the rhetoric. We have to get something done. Today we have two Republican leaders with us who have been strong business advocates over the years and strong partners of both ourselves and the BIA, both before and during the pandemic. And I know going forward, they'll be the same. Uh, and we all look forward to hearing what they have to say and give, give us their thoughts on where we go from here. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Michelle Sikirka who will introduce our two speakers. Thank you. Um Good morning, everyone. Such a pleasure to have you join us this morning. And it's my pleasure to welcome our guests today, Senate Republican Leader Tom Kane and Assembly Republican Leader John Bramnick, who have been leading the legislature's efforts to help New Jersey businesses reopen safely and even more importantly, survive through the COVID. Uh, right now, as we know in New Jersey, we have a public health and an economic crisis, as Tom mentioned. And Senator Kane and Assemblyman Bramnick fully recognize the legitimate need to proper safeguard um, our public health but they also recognize the need to protect people's livelihoods. And they understand that the pandemic response must balance these two objectives in a meaningful manner for a safe and responsible reopening. So to do so, both have been standing up for the business community through their legislative efforts. And in addition, they've been calling on the governor's office for greater transparency in the decision-making process regarding the executive orders that are impacting New Jersey's businesses. Both gentlemen have a long time and are long time advocates for fiscal prudence, which we know right now is significantly important given the millions of dollars in lost tax revenues that New Jersey is experiencing and the tough budget decisions that are yet to come. Tax increases and further mandates on business are not the solution. A comprehensive look at the budget that balances reform is the solution. So NJBIA and New Jersey Chamber are pleased to welcome today Senator Kane and Assemblyman Bramick, and I will yield the floor to Senator Kane at this time. Uh, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everybody who's on this uh, phone call and the Zoom uh, for, for making the time to participate in today's conversation. I also want to thank all of you for uh, building your businesses and, and growing your you know, growing economies and taking a, um, the opportunity to grow in New Jersey. But in order to stay in New Jersey and have generations of people being able to afford to live in New Jersey, uh, the governor and the executive branch needs to create a long-term plan that is transparent. I mean, right now, so many people are concerned because it seems to be that the decisions are being 
changed on a daily basis. And that lack of consistency, that uh, true transparency in the data means that families and businesses and nonprofits can't make the plans that both keep their employees and their families safe, but also allow them to get, engage in their daily businesses and daily uh, ways to go about business. And so if we were actually able to have the transparency in the type of data for how the governor is making these health decisions, when you look in uh, New York State, neighboring state, uh, there is that type of consistency. There is that type of predictability, and people know where they are in the reopening process. Same is true in many other states within the region. But unfortunately, the governor has uh, been less than transparent in allowing anybody, whether any citizen of the state, to truly understand how and why he's making decisions regarding the health or the economic decisions he's doing. Um, there is no question that we need to keep our uh, citizens safe, and the first and foremost priority of the government is to do that, is to keep people safe. And we, but we also have to understand that you can trust people by following the CDC guidelines as they're making the decisions because it is in everybody's best interest to grow the economy while keeping people safe. Uh, and one of the ways you could do that, and I think the frustration thing that a lot of people had was early on, the governor, because it's usually about two or three days behind the governors of Pennsylvania and New York, um, had a better decision in terms of what an essential business was than either Cuomo or the Pennsylvania governor did. So we had a little bit more flexibility right at the very, very beginning. And so more people could actually come in and, and make businesses operate. That unfortunately uh, did not last as long because then the governor simply uh, slowed down many of his decision-making processes and, and created a lot less uh, transparency. And unfortunately, when th pro programs like the CARES Act and other things came through and the $2.4 billion did come to New Jersey, where other states released hundreds of millions of dollars to help out their small businesses immediately, the governor hoarded all that money and did not get the money, the early money in an amount of money that was really going to be necessary and helpful out to help people in their, in their immediate times of needs. We need to have more of that CARES Act money released to the, to the businesses and, and the nonprofits and others uh, in, a, in a meaningful and timely fashion because people need those, those operating dollars in order to continue their businesses. My, my budget committee members have been aggressive in saying there are better ways, whether it be on the, um, some of the uh, furlough reforms that they had originally passed the legislature on a bipartisan basis and then was changed dramatically just, just last week. Uh, so it did not have actually any real meaningful savings uh, immediately or over time. My caucus has been offering real meaningful time sensitive solutions that make sure that this governor is making decisions that um, is transparent for the people of, of this, this state. Um, there are things we need to also need to do to understand that everybody in this room knows that many people are not commuting into New York City or actually into Philadelphia as much as they were. Uh, so we should make sure that our treasurer is doing everything that our division of taxation is doing everything they can can to make sure that the New Jersey, which lose, which, which would typically lose, you know, about four billion dollars a year, I think, into New York and New York State, we can certainly understand that much of that that business activity is actually happening in the state. So we should not be talking about increases tax increase in taxes. We should not be talking about increases in spending right now. We should be focusing on ways to, you know, focus on making responsible government decision making, but also make sure that other states are not you know, taking advantage of New Jersey citizens. We should, we've got to have predictability in this process. And a great ally in this regard um, over time has been John Bramick, who is the, is the leader of the Assembly Republican Caucus, who brings a great deal of common, of common sense approach to the decision making that he has um, focused on in the, in the state assembly. So John, my good friend, uh, John Bramick. Thanks, Senator Simmons, looking good. Got the tie and jacket on. You got a senatorial office behind you. Look really good. Hi, everybody. Uh, Tom, I'm not going to give the governor a lot of kudos. I am going to say at the beginning, taking um, charge, I think there was a period of time where I thought his decisions were well-meaning and strong. Here's my problem. Uh, if you're going to make decisions and run the state by executive order, you need to have hearings. You need to hear from restaurant owners, business owners, infectious disease experts, you, you need people to testify in front of the legislature. The governor can sit there and listen, but everyone has to have a voice. You can't come out at 1 p.m. every day and dictate 
uh, what you think should happen. Now, he, whether he's wrong or right, I'm not going to debate the medicine here. What I am going to debate is whether or not we should have open hearings. I've been calling for those hearings by the Senate and by the Assembly. The governor should have those hearings as well. We've had hearings down on in Trenton on things were inconsequential. This is about people's lives, and it's being made behind closed doors. So one, open up the process. When I say open up the process, listen to the business owner in Cape May or the business owner in Sussex County or in Jersey City. Let them come to the table. This should be eight hours a day of discussion. And then if the governor comes, says, okay, I'm going to continue an executive order and makes a decision, at least we've had an opportunity to be heard. That's number one. Number two, when motor vehicles opened, you saw the kind of organization that this, this administration has. Now, they knew for three months, and I understand this is not necessarily a business issue, but it affects everyone. When you open up an agency after three months and you let people stand outside for hours and hours and hours, and there's no one out there, maybe one person from motor vehicles, that's disrespect for the citizens of this state. I'm telling you that whether you're for masks, against masks, masks in public, masks in restaurants, indoor dining, that should be an open discussion. When was the last time we had a hearing on these important issues that are affecting everyone? That's number one. With respect to restaurant and indoor dining. Now, all of us run businesses, right? The governor says, we're going to open on July 2nd. Now, he doesn't say, listen, we're going to open on July 2nd, but don't do anything yet because I want to see the numbers the Monday before. I think July 2nd was a Thursday. He could have said, hey, listen, on Monday, I am going to make a final decision. So don't spend any money. Don't bring back your employees. Now, how do you argue with the fact that you say you're going to open and you don't really hedge your bets? Tell the business community, I haven't made a final decision. I think I'm going to open on July 2nd. See, that's disrespectful also. And I'm not saying it's intentional disrespect. I call it negligent disrespect. Look, any of you run a business, you can't run a business with that kind of uh, that that kind of message. Yeah, we're gonna open. Oh no, we're not. It doesn't work like that. So, as far as I'm concerned, the business community has to say, even if we disagree with you, we want an opportunity to be heard. When did anyone have an opportunity to be heard? And with respect to my friends in the legislature, an emergency, a state of emergency. Look, as far as I recall, we closed roads for a few days because of snow. There may be civil disorder. We have to take control of curfew. But you don't run a state by a state of emergency with executive orders for three, four, five months. And it looks to me that legislation is going to be done by a governor. Once again, I am not questioning the seriousness of COVID-19. I am not questioning the fact that we were going to be overrun at hospitals. I am questioning that we need to be heard and we're not. And I'm deeply concerned about this. And I'm hoping that the Democratic majority at least has hearings. Thank you. And thank you, Senator, for uh, your leadership, which is always strong. So I, I think we want to move on to our Q&A, and I know uh, Chrissy Butis and Mike Eggington are going to lead the Q&A. So Chrissy, you want to pick up and start the Q&A? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for your comments, and, and thank you for uh, your leadership uh, with respect to making sure that the business community's voice is being heard throughout this discussion. I think you hit the nail on the head um, with respect to having some predictability um, around, you know, what are the, the health statistics used to make certain decisions, um, as well as a need to have predictability for the business community on when things are going to open as well. While, while a lot of our businesses are continuing to struggle though, uh, several of them or many of them are in the process of reopening at this point in time, and they're all trying to figure out, you know, what are the next steps and what concerns, you know, do they have to be mindful of uh, with respect to having their employees and their patrons coming back? Uh, there were several hearings held, you know, in the Senate where higher education came in, day camps, uh, et cetera, that talked about a lot of the concerns around 
what liability is a business you know going to be open to um, should you know when they reopen and their their patrons come back in our businesses are doing all they can to make sure everything is as safe as possible adhering to CDC guidelines I think we've all been out and about wearing face masks having plastic coverings and they're doing all that they can to make sure everyone's safe however we want to make sure that they're not um, liable for any type of frivolous lawsuit that might come by um, where someone can make a claim that because they were on their premise premises that they contracted the virus there um, any type of litigation to that effect will be so counterproductive when our businesses have been closed for over 16 weeks and again this covers our higher ed institutions businesses nonprofits you name it so can you uh, elaborate a little bit about what your thoughts are on making sure that the business community is protected from frivolous lawsuits uh, there is legislation that's introduced in both houses and we'd love to hear your thoughts hey Tom if you don't mind I'll take this because I'm a plaintiff's personal injury lawyer uh, let me start with the fact that when you say frivolous lawsuits, uh, not all lawsuits are frivolous, right? But if, if we take that out, frivolous lawsuits, and we talk about what the standard should be for the business community, I run a law office with 50 people, right? I can tell you that no one knows how to handle this. So therefore, we should definitely have legislation that limits mm -hmm. cases that people say, I got this COVID-19 and I had a terrible situation as a result of something I caught in a business. I don't disagree with that. And the reason I don't disagree, because it's almost impossible to figure out what a business is supposed to do. It's almost impossible to figure out where somebody got COVID-19. So I agree with you that we need some sort of uh, legislation. I haven't reviewed all the legislation for the Senate and the Assembly yet, but something to protect businesses from what you say frivolous lawsuits. Now, you're going to see that we did pass, I think it was unanimously, to protect doctors, hospital employees against so-called malpractice cases during this crisis so people could work outside of their departments. But getting back to this situation with COVID-19, what I did here, to give you some sense, we put up plastic barriers all over the place, right? We have a ability that if you come in, you know, take your temperature, et cetera. But I agree with you. The standard, we don't even understand this virus. So I'm not sure how we would be able to tell a business person how to protect their environment. And as and you said, and but uh it's a question of if we had a standard, which we don't, and if were, and we knew what businesses should do, I might change my mind. But in this stage, it is so nebulous that nobody knows what to do, and the experts change their opinions all the time. So I'm good with that kind of uh, that limitation, even as a, a trial lawyer. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I was the um, prime sponsor of the piece of legislation in the Senate that John mentioned regarding the liability for the nurses and the doctors and the hospital and health systems uh, because again, people were not, you know, didn't feel safe volunteering or cross, going across practices. Uh, and so I, like John, I agree that having a, some sort of a safe harbor provision as long as individuals are following known guidelines, I mean, following the CDC, having evidentiary ways to say, we've got the plastic barriers, we've got the face mask, we've got the temperature checks. Those types of active things should be uh, allow a business to open and be protected in that regard. Thank you. Um, Senator and, and Assemblyman, I have a question for you. Um, what uh, Chrissy talked about, the liability issue, from day one, the two biggest issues I've had are the liability issue as number two. Number one is an issue that has yet to be addressed and to me is the gatekeeper for this economic recovery. And that is, where is the capital going to come from to finance the business community in the recovery period. The, the capital in the pre-recovery period was woefully inadequate. The state does not have the balance sheet. The EDA does not have the balance sheet to finance businesses going forward any meaningful degree. And we cannot rely on the federal programs because they have been very, very uh, badly constructed. And quite frankly, the PPP program still has $130 billion of availability left that nobody wants to touch because of how badly that's been mismanaged. We need to have money 
to finance these businesses. Nobody has addressed this. We've been banging the drum on this from day one. Do either of you have any idea of where the money's gonna come from or could potentially come from? Because if the money's not there, forget about the liability issues, forget about the startup issues, nothing's gonna happen without money. Well, I think there, if you're talking about um, EDA and everything else, there's, I mean, EDA's done, you know, $100 million total, and that was oversubscribed in an hour worth of applications, right, of going online. So clearly, in Pennsylvania did $250 million right up front. Um, there is what, two, over $2 billion of money that is does have the flexibility to use for things like this, um, not filling budget holes as the governor wants it to do, but can be used for financing that should be released. Um, and I think that the governor has not done a, a good job in getting that money out. Um, the other issues, though, that we need to do is actually open the economy. I mean, th this governor's been slow on getting, you know, a key issue that has not been addressed in a meaningful way, way really by this governor is the issue of child care. You know, individual, we need to have a fully operating child care system so that people know the kids are safe. Now, tied into that is the education decisions that are going to be happening this fall. So it, people need to know that they, they have, you know, that the kids are taken care of, that they're safe. And if you have that type of child care system, you can have more businesses able to be, you know, opening up uh, in more predictable ways. All, all great issues, but still, without yeah. the availability Thanks. of working yeah. capital, uh, yeah. it's going to be tough for somebody. And that's that's the question. Yeah, and Senator, hey, if Tom, I could just uh, also chime in on um, on what Tom was uh, mentioning as well. And you're absolutely correct with the Federal CARES Act funding have over $2 billion coming in that has to be used on COVID-related expenses. Um, the the Treasurer gave an update, as you know, back during the during the budget hearings for this three-month temporary budget. And um, within that proposal, there's a $100 million of that, over $2 billion all allocated to small business. 50 million of which is for direct relief to business, which went to the EDA. So that's 2% of that $2 billion. We would love to see a lot more money of the CARES Act funding, you know, being utilized to get our small businesses back up and running to, you know, to Tom's point. Um, it is just so clear right now the critical role that the business community plays in making sure that we have a strong economy, uh, especially when we just saw our GDP numbers coming out and our GDP you know, um, you know, has taken a hit, which is you know gr even greater than the national average at this point. So, would love to see more more uh, advocacy and, and push to, towards using that those federal dollars. I, I started. That's that's how I started my conversation today. And when any time that we've been with the governor, anybody within the administration, um, well, we we we've been asking every single time, what's holding back the release of the month, whether it's for federal purposes or, or excuse me, business purposes or any other COVID related expenses. And there's no answer as to why that money hasn't been distributed other, other than simply saying, we'd rather have it in our pockets, not in the business pockets. And that's, that's an unacceptable answer. We need to be able to get the money out in the street, prove that it's being used rationally. I mean, if it, I would argue that if you're any business or anybody um, in this process, you say, Look, we distributed this money. We did it in a timely fashion. This is the people, the businesses that we help. These are the people that are in other related fields that we help. And we did it well. Doing something well reinforces the message to the federal government that you can be trusted to use the money for its allotted purpose. Simply holding on to the money until the tail end of the year to, fill a, to try to fill a budget gap is not a responsible use of the money. This money should be out in whether it's in the business through the EDA or other uh, expenses and other costs that are related to COVID, real time as it being just held as a cash reserve for other purposes. Uh, Senator so Kane, uh, I wanted to continue the uh, the questions. We're getting some questions from our audience, and wanted to thank you and Leader Bramnick again for being with us. And Mike, Mike, do you want me to talk about the money situation for business? Yeah, yeah go ahead. ahead. You can fill it out, John. Sorry, go ahead. So, yeah. Um, well, first, when the governor came to the assembly and asked us to borrow a minimum of five billion, a maximum of fourteen billion, there was absolutely no discussion between the administration and us as to where that money was going to go. And if you don't, business has a, a tough uh, road to hoe here to begin with. And post uh, COVID nineteen, it's going to be much harder. While the governor focused on making sure all state employees. Uh, we're not furloughed, we're not laid off, 
despite the fact they weren't coming into their offices. This is a priority issue. Now, you know, once again, this is what makes politics. He's made decisions where his lane is, what his focus is. And that's why, Chrissy, you're not getting a response for the business community. You're not necessarily in that lane. So consequently, uh, when you have one party rule down in Trenton, you know, an overwhelming Democratic majority in both houses, and you have a Democratic governor who rules by executive order, this is where you, that's why you're not going to have a serious discussion. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, money needs to go into supporting businesses and substantial amount of money, because otherwise you'll have more exodus from this state. All right, thank you, uh, Leader Bramnick. Um, as both of you know, we're back into legislative committee hearings. What's interesting is we went from the Monday, Thursday formula to almost committees every single day now virtually. So it keeps us on our toes. Um, a lot of the bills early on were COVID-19 uh, pandemic related. Now we're starting to get into uh, other bills. And of course, as Christy pointed out, um, our drive is gonna be this next budget and holding the line because as both of you know, you know, taxes is not an option for our members. We did get uh, multiple members from um, the business community and from the development community asking about a bill that's making uh, its way swiftly through the uh, legislature. It's the Environmental Justice Bill. It's uh, Senate Bill uh, 232, and it did pass uh, uh, the Senate. And uh, this member wanted to thank you, Senator Kane, for your no vote. Um, Leader Bramnick, the question to you is, um, what are you hearing in the assembly as far as level of support of the bill? And is there any opportunity uh, for amendments uh, like a removal of the renewal of permits for existing facilities? There's a lot of folks that are, are worried what, what impact this will have on any new manufacturing or expansion. Just like to get both maybe your thoughts uh, on this legislation. Uh, I haven't spoken to Speaker Coughlin. It's good news that we haven't voted on it yet. Right, because normally when they rush something through, they put it through both houses at the same time. So it's delayed for some reason. Here's my concern. When you title a bill environmental justice, right, the title seems like anybody who votes against it is against justice and against the environment. I have not heard from the speaker actually last couple of days, the first time I started to get calls on this. But you know, what we have to do is make sure that. Uh, that there's enough Democrats who realize the problems with the bill, and that's going to take the chamber and others and NJBIA and others to reach out to that those Democrats who are not anti-business to stop it. Uh, I doubt that there'll be much support in my caucus. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Kane, did you want to, I know it did pass the Senate, just wanted to get your thoughts on it in your caucus. Well, I think, I think the caucus, my, no, my caucus felt at the time, as with any piece of legislation, that anything can be fixed, anything can be improved in this regard. I think we all have the same goals of making sure that we have both healthy communities, as, uh, you know, and, and you know, protect the environment, but also grow businesses. And there's a way you can accomplish all three of those goals. But this bill wasn't it because of the, the way it was put together and the, the group of the, the extent of the permits, repermits, uh, and repermitting there. But there, there's always a pathway to find. If people want to find the answer, my experience in the legislature, they find the answer. If they don't want to find the answer, they, they rush it through on, on a day's notice. Yeah, Assemblyman, to your point, I think you 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 know or are aware, and if not now you are, uh, that we do have a coalition that is, that is up and running, um, really looking at all the different pieces of the bill uh, in order to find uh, where the pro appropriate balance is. Um, and there's a lot of room in that bill for a lot more balance. Yeah. And I would say that one thing about Speaker Coughlin is he's always open to having a discussion and, you know, he's a measured person and consequently he's nor normally somebody we can communicate with. So offline when we're done with this, we should talk about maybe having a joint call with the Speaker. Thank you. Chris, do you have a follow-up? Sure. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about the budget. And um, for those who, who are viewing, um, the, the governor just did sign a temporary three-month budget. 
uh, that went into effect and our next fiscal year budget needs to be decided upon by September 30th. Uh, so uh, one of the few states in the nation that have moved our fiscal year budget back uh, so we're going to have a busy summer. I know a lot of committees are going to be meeting. There's going to be budget hearings. Uh, I know we're all hoping for more federal relief. Uh, we know that you know, borrowing has been discussed, as you mentioned, as well um, as uh, hopefully spending cuts are a part of that conversation. I think even pre-COVID, there was a lot of conversation about how the state is on really shaky fiscal footing. Um, and so we don't want to miss an opportunity here to make those tough decisions that need to be made to make sure that the state you know, can grow moving forward. And additionally, tax increases um, are something that I know, you know, certainly not popular, um, but want to make sure that they're not imposed upon, again, the business community, which has really, really taken the brunt of uh, this, this pandemic right now. Uh, so I'd just love to hear your thoughts from each of your respective caucuses on how you're going to be approaching uh, this really uh, a tough budget coming up uh, for the next nine months. Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll follow the exact same pattern we did for the for the three month budget by um, offering alternatives, finding the, you know part, finding bipartisan solutions where we can. I mean, the, the original furlough bill that came out of the states and and went through the assembly both unanimously in, in back in I think it was May, um, and then sat on the governor's desk for months on end, and then and then was brought back and and in a very very different form that really didn't have any immediate or long or long long term savings for the taxpayers. Um and you know then was passed on a party line vote. Um was I think we had was a lost opportunity for for the for the legislature to to actually step up and again say, you know, we passed the first time unanimously we should have had a, found a solution on, on on the furlough side. Um and when you look at what the governor did for the first three months, there's bipartisan opposition to the budget in the state Senate. And what the governor did was he pushed off what a billion dollars worth of the costs into the next nine months. That's not actually a re reduction of spending. That's a, a delay of spending and a delay of decision making until the next budget. So my expectation is that my caucus and especially Steve Orojo, Mike Testa, um, and uh, and the other members of the uh, deck and uh, the other members of the uh, Sam, you know, Sam Thompson, the other members of the uh, budget team will be able to focus on um, the real answers that Low, make sure there are no tax increases because we shouldn't be increasing taxes in this environment. We shouldn't be increasing spending in this environment. We should be able to show that we can release the money we just talked about earlier that the federal government has already sent. Um, those should be out. That should be out the door in a way that actually helps grow the economy. So you can have a, a, a system where you or have the growing economy at the exact same time and with, with more transparency in, in decision making at the exact same time we're, we're dealing with the, the budget issue in. in uh, for the next nine months. And from the assembly side, uh, it's time to introduce almost a pre-bankruptcy package, looking at the revenue shortfalls in, in, the, um, in the budget and the outstanding debt for the state, as well as the unfunded liabilities for pensions. We need to propose, and we have, many reforms that are absolutely necessary, because what's going to happen here based on, I think, any business person's view of the future. This state is heading towards bankruptcy. No doubt about it, just a question of when. So this tax and spend mentality, I think is about to end. When you hit a crisis of this proportion, you know that this is gonna accelerate us to a point where we cannot afford to pay our bills. So consequently, the message has to come forward that business as usual as a governor or as a legislature is over those numbers are going to be front and center very soon and when they're front and center and we can no longer pay our bills we're going to have to introduce what i call as pre-bankruptcy package it's going to have to cut change reform the way new jersey government does business Otherwise, we'll end up with some federal bankruptcy judge determining who gets paid and how. I mean, this is not just some prediction. This is an absolute fact based on the numbers. And I feel terrible for a business community has to go through this and has to, has to suffer in terms of new taxes as well as the average citizen. So I think we have to face the music now. And that's what we're going to present as a caucus.
You know, gentlemen, um, before COVID, we were, you know, we consistently talked about the challenges about migration, uh, wealth leaving the state as well as business leaving the state. And um, I could just tell you, literally, uh, a colleague, and I, I found out in an off odd way, okay, all of a sudden I got a pop up that uh, suddenly they, they're in North Carolina. And, uh, and I said, I didn't know you were going to North Carolina, what you know, and, and he said, and he's very, very smart person. And he, he said, um, I cannot see New Jersey working their way out of here. I have two children going to college uh, in the fall, whatever college looks like. I have to protect my business and I couldn't stay another day. And literally within a month, they upped and moved and sold their house. That's fearful to me um, that, that there's this feeling of desperation and devastation that people are looking forward and saying, we don't think we can see the state come out of this. And that's why the balance and the need for the reform is stronger and harder than ever right now. We cannot come out of this budget, as you said, with a business as usual. Now's the time that we need to really put that uh, line in the sand and say, for New Jersey, we need to do something different. One further comment, when well, we passed, or about to pass, or we did actually, that billion dollar loan deal, and then in the fine print, it said, you could impose a statewide property tax or a statewide wealth tax. And then the Democrats said, well, that's in all of our bills uh, when we borrow money. No, this is different. This is 5 billion or 14 billion. So what I spoke to a number of individuals who said, they fear the wealth tax as well as the property tax. My concern is this is the first time that language is going to be used and if you start imposing a wealth tax, the, would you say your friend went to North Carolina? Yeah, this is a North South Carolina, Florida. This is an advertisement for all those states. It is a, it is just a terrible message to the people who work and pay taxes here. The sad, the sad thing about this conversation, I think, is that you know this this pandemic has created a huge opportunity that we're going to miss, and the opportunity is. There's a great, um, uh, this is the best time I can think of to attract uh, residents and businesses from New York and from Pennsylvania and from Connecticut. And because of the way we are handling our budget, because of the way we are handling our recovery, we are not making our state attractive uh, to uh, create that kind of um, a magnet to bring these people in here. You know, I keep hearing about, and you got my, both might want to comment on this, the, there's discussions going on about creating a new incentive program for the state. I, I frankly don't think there's any incentive program that can be created that will overcome the negatives that we're facing, the pending bankruptcy, John, that you talked about. Uh, we, can't, we can't overcome that. I mean, no matter how we paint it, no matter how attractive we can make it. So the way we come out of this recovery, how quickly we come out of this recovery, how supportive the government is to the business community, that's the biggest attraction and the biggest advertisement we can have, much more so than any kind of new incentive package. I think that what, when people look at the decisions coming out of Trenton, you know, every July or every September or you know, February as well, or maybe whenever, whenever the governor gives his, his fall budget address, there's always a threat of a new tax or a new regulation. And whether it's the headline or the reality of those things coming to bear, I mean, that's what people see every day. And, and, they're, and they're fearful of that. In Massachusetts, since, since 1977, it used to be known as tax Massachusetts. We all grew up with that. And, but that, there's been no state that's actually changed its tax policy more than Massachusetts is. And you don't know whether, from a higher education perspective, where, where college ends and a small business, you know, Starts. You don't know from a tax incentive. If you're in Boston, you've got the exact same regulations as uh, something in, in uh, Western Massachusetts, the exact same amount of money. Uh, so it's consistency in that regard. You're not increasing the income tax. I mean, Massachusetts has got, uh, was it 5.6 or 6.2? I don't remember what, what it is right now. But they haven't increased the, the income tax, whether it was a Republican governor or a Democratic governor. Uh, and the same thing can be true, said of, of, of Virginia, North Carolina number of other places, that type of consistency over time means that people can invest and grow their, keep their families in the state and grow the opportunities over time because there's that type of consistent predictability. When you're talking about income tax increases, regulatory increases, I, I had a conversation with somebody 
just two days ago, and, and she was talking about how she was set to move her manufacturing and her um, everything else out of the state, actually to North Carolina. And she said that she had operated in six states, including California, including Texas, including three or four other places. And she said, even including California, New Jersey had the worst bureaucratic and regulatory and legal, I mean, law, law environment of any operations um, state. And this was a food related industry. And she said she was now, unfortunately, being forced to move many of her operations down to North Carolina. Um, but she was saying it wasn't just us versus North Carolina, it was us versus California, us versus New York, us versus many other states that you wouldn't normally think of as having a, a, uh, a weaker or lesser regulatory legal environment. We got you. We got you. And the, we have and the sad thing, and the sad thing, Senator, is that in addition to what you said on the negative side, we are blessed with some of the best demographics of any state in the country. You combine that with the location we have, we're just wasting that opportunity because of all the things you talked about. We've got a great workforce, highly educated, dynamic workforce. We've got the best best public schools in the country. We've got the best um, residents. We've got great geography. And we, we, we've got a great work ethic, and we've got to be able to harness that and take advantage of that in our regulatory and tax policies. Hey, gentlemen, I, you know, I um, had someone weighing, and I know we have questions coming in through, but you know, the idea of a uh, a pro growth bipartisan caucus to really start addressing these issues. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I always say to folks, we're we're a purple state at the end of the day, and we always were. For the most part, um, our policies in New Jersey historically have come somewhere in the middle, right? Um, whether you're more liberal um, socially and a little more conservative fiscally, right? We've always been a, a good purple state. And we also know there's so much room because for consensus in the middle. If there's five issues, we should be able to take three of them at least, right? The other two park in the parking lot, but find some consensus on some. But what about the concept of a pro-growth pro bipartisan um, caucus? Well, I'd love to weigh in on that. Uh, you know, when you have one party rule, a Democratic governor, a Democratic legislature, and you can set up this committee, but guess what? They got to go, the Democrats have to go to the governor or they have to go to their leadership in order to pass anything, right? This is a street fight for survival. You set up a committee like that and you'll have a lot of discussions and then they got to get the approval of the leadership. They're not going to get it because this governor is one lane. And once again, I don't criticize his politics. His politics got him to be the governor, right? But his lane is not a lane where he's interested really in dealing with the business community. His lane, uh, it's hard to describe it, but it's not a pro-business, pro-growth lane. I don't think that's in his uh, repertoire. So my point is, you set up that committee, you might as well set it up with the speaker and the Senate president because they have the votes to override the governor. And the reason, I'm just being practical now. I'd love to have this discussion if I knew at the end of the day that the speaker and the Senate president would post whatever we decided. But to have this discussion and hear everybody's pro-business, everybody's pro-growth, this, this is a street fight where people have to realize that there's an, ex, there's an exodus of our businesses and our people. And that has to be made clear. Uh, I'm happy to sit on that committee, but I don't have the votes. I just want to add just one more thing. There's a whole new dimension here with remote work, right? When Tom Tom talked about, and we talk about the, the um, uh, GROW program or the future GROW 2.0 or otherwise, right? The whole concept of remote work environment is going to affect the state. And it could affect us in a positive, as Tom noted, where we can pick up from the region because we have suburban areas where people may feel a little more comfortable now, right? But, you know, I hear already Greater Atlanta is poaching our region um, and we have nothing to offer to offer back. So there are new rules to the game and that there's new considerations. We didn't have remote work concerns before. That's real. That's going to affect office parks all across the country. And then, you know, how do we take an opportunity like that and seize on it in a way to address some type of a new program to make us attractive for that type of a balanced work-life environment? Well, I, I think there are a couple of things that we that we can do. Um, we should take advantage of the fact that it used to be three-month inventory in the supply chain was necessary. It's now probably six months or longer. So we should make sure 
from a manufacturing facility because we've got great farmer, great, great biotech, great, great um, innovators in, in New Jersey. We've got to make sure that those innovators innovators actually continue to work here and can actually continue to operate during COVID or, or a few subsequent uh, set of circumstances. We then have to make sure that, so we've got to make sure there's a manufacturing side to that. We've got to tie the, the higher education uh, entities into the uh, the businesses in, in, in a way that they're not tied into right now. So that people know that things like the Rutgers um, merger was a huge game changer for the state of New Jersey. And we should be able to capitalize, and I was happy that the legislature did that. Um, and we've got to capitalize on that going forward because that's really tying, bringing in more NIH grants and everything else into the state of New Jersey. We've got to you know make sure that, from a, as you were talking about before, so many opportunities for people in New Jersey and not crossing the Hudson for, to uh, get there uh, to create the job and find and, and find employment. So we've got to change our policies in New Jersey to reflect new work patterns, new commuting patterns, new times for doing that, and also make sure that as we're going forward in this regard, we've got to recognize that right now, um, this state is not focusing, is not trying to count our employees. They're still allowing New York to count a lot of the people who live in throughout New Jersey as, as if they're still commuting into New York City, which we all know nobody has done for three months. So from a revenue perspective, from a, and we just gotta make sure that our downtowns are, are able to do that, our office parks are able to be changed and transformed in that way. We will take grant, you know, grant and innovation uh, programs, and I think that does make some sense. But rather than focus on those types of solutions, um, this legislature right now, in the midst of, the, of this pandemic, is actually trying to change the rules for redistricting. Redistricting is, is the, the uh, process that happens every 10 years and de does determines how, who is in control of the legislature. Now, the map has not reflected the will of the voter in New Jersey for 20 years. So when, when John or I, when our caucus members win 52% of the vote, 53% of the seat, vote, we get 40% of the seats over the course of the last 20 years. Or when, and when the Democrat majority wins 53% of the vote, they get 65% of the seats. That's what the map has done in New Jersey for the last 20 years. But instead of doing hearings now on programs that you're talking about, Michelle, the, the legislature in the coming days is trying to push a constitutional amendment that will push off redistricting and the results of redistricting for two more years, um, as opposed to focusing on uh, the solutions that are and, and, make, and, and try to cement their majorities for two more years, rather than solving the day-to-day -day concerns of people who are making very difficult decisions as to whether to be able to stay in the state and, and, and provide for their families. And just to follow up, you know, even though government can do the wrong thing, we can get lucky sometimes. And I know some of the suburbs, because people are concerned about living in urban environments in New York because of the COVID and big buildings and small spaces, you know, in Westfield and in Summit, the demand for housing is going way up. So sometimes, despite, uh, in my judgment, an anti-business environment, a pro-tax environment, but sometimes the state can get lucky based on the its ge geographic location, as Tom said. So that's a little good news. Now we got to keep those people in the state. And maybe, you know, we've got transit problems getting in and out of New York, but maybe people realize now that they don't actually have to be there. I mean, even I'm shocked on how well a law office works now where maybe only half the employees are here. So maybe uh, we, we dodged a bullet on some of the transit issues. We increase the demand for suburban housing, which may be helpful. Now we have to send a message out of Trenton that we're here to help as opposed to make any opportunity in this state more complex. You know, just on the issue of uh, getting, getting back to the issue of communication for one second, um, which I think is very important and all of you have touched on that in your, in your conversations. Um, you know, this is, this is a time right now when we're into this recovery where communicating needs to be uh, enhanced more than decreased. And we have a situation in New Jersey right now where all of us used to be on a call with the governor's staff twice a week. That is now down to once a week and more, and, and that's been canceled uh, several times. So there is no communication at all during the week. The governor is now down to three news conferences a, a, a week versus five. The recovery and restart committee is over. Uh, that ended on after eight meetings, just like they said it would. Forget about the fact that it was needed to be continued after eight meetings. That stopped. 
And uh, there's been no communication since that stopped about a week and a half ago. And the issue that, that we have with regard to communication is we need to be able to bring our issues forward as we were doing during the pre-recovery phase. And as the governor has cut his uh, news conferences down to three times a week, the news conferences still focus on the medical issue, which has gotten under control. We have ad nauseum said, why don't you start to filter in and balance those news conferences with the business crisis and talk about the business crisis and what's being done. I can't remember a time other than the fact that Tim Sullivan has been on twice at those, uh, those press conferences, any discussion at all about the economic crisis we face. So the whole issue of communication is needed more than ever and it's being, and it's being cut back and, um, and the lack of discussion, honest, open discussion on the economic crisis to me is just deplorable. Thank you. I love it what you said. Love it. You know, one thing we have to do in the private sector is we have to run a campaign. And I know Michelle does it on the radio quite a bit, which is pretty good. Whether it's billboards, you know, this, as I said, this is a street fight. The public has to understand that the problems in the economy, the problems in unemployment are going to be directly related to decisions down in Trenton. So as I said, we got to put on the gloves or take the gloves off and start the fight because nobody's, nobody's coming to hear what you have to say, Tom. Chuck, you're breaking up. Can you hear me? You're breaking up. Mm -hmm. I think we've lost your okay, audio. That? Okay, well, I won't talk. Let Tom talk. Tom, uh -huh. you talk. You're back. <laughs> All right. Hey, Senator, are you, are you fine? We're, we're closing in on the hour. Can I ask another question or two just to sure. get some in? Because we got multiple ones. Um, speaking of regionally, I'm sure you both have heard from your local regional chambers of commerce up in your area. And uh, we got several questions and coming from many people asking do you both of you anticipate any additional federal dollars coming to new jersey to help businesses i might add that uh, local regional chambers of commerce are uh, characterized as 501c6s and they have yet to receive any help whatsoever and a lot of them um, we've heard from many of them are in dire straits so uh, and i'm sure they've been reaching out to both of you just wanted to see uh what efforts you can do to you know, get Congress to uh, consider if they make one more go at it uh, to help out the 501c6 community. Yeah, they, they, they certainly, I know that um, John and I and, and uh, Joe Cry and, and uh, Nick Scatari uh, made sure that the uh, the EDA grant, second second program, we, we worked together with, a, you know, with the EDA to make sure that that, that program had a little bit more flexibility for some nonprofits. So we're actually were able to expand the scope, but the uh, the next project with whatever, whatever comes out of, of Washington D.C. needs to um, address some of the concerns you just you just stated. John, uh, 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 yeah, we're uh, and once again, I'm not trying to make this partisan. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, good. I'm not trying to make this partisan, but when you only have well, now you have one and I'm sorry, two Republican Congress people, right? Um, you know now. We're represented mostly by Democrats in our district, uh, but clearly we've reached out uh, to everyone and said to them, listen, you know, these, these are viable organizations that need help. And, and as far as we're concerned, that's a, that's a very important plan. And I know Tom and I have reached out to try to get the Congress to work on that. And, and to that point, if I could uh, build off of what Mike has said in terms of, you know, getting more funding to our C6s, our nonprofit community, our small businesses, um, still struggling pandemic has created really unprecedented times. And as our businesses are struggling to reopen, they are going to be faced with come another six months, another uh, mandatory minimum wage increase. Um, which is just going to, again, layer on some of the challenges that they already face. Um, and they're already facing increased costs for PPE, which they, of course, need to, to protect their employees and, the, and their patrons. Can you talk to us a little bit more about your thoughts on the, the mandatory minimum wage increase that's set to go into effect in six months? I think we need to... 
Go ahead, JB. No, we, since we didn't support it to begin with, right? Uh, it makes no sense to have something mandatory. Actually, this was part of the debate at that time. You're predicting the future, having automatic increases, regardless of whether it's a crisis or not. And I remember speaking, or I didn't say it, but people spoke about it on the floor. Uh, this is what government does best, right? They do things that don't, they're great without any common sense. So now you have to redo legislation because you had an automatic increase in it. Just ridiculous. You know, hopefully uh, the majority party will join with us and change that. No, I, I think that the, um, you have to find the right balance in this regard. I mean, so many of these small businesses are struggling to open and with the additional costs, they need to look at this as one of the costs we need to look at again. Just wanted to get, um, as they said, we're getting close to the hour. I wanted to squeeze some more questions in. We had a couple of people ask to get your insight and opinion on the executive order yesterday by the governor on mandatory outdoor mask use. Senator? Uh, well, I, I think the, the it was in the context of if you can't socially distance, wear a mask, which means within six right. feet. Um, I'm fine with that. Okay. John? I think the concept of people wearing masks is a good one. I think that when you write these executive orders, they're somewhat confusing or sometimes they're interpreted by the media in a way either very negatively or very positively. And in this case, the governor has to make it clear what he said. And that is, listen, you don't always have to have a mask on, but if you're within six feet of people, right? We want you and we're gonna write this order to wear a mask, okay? And I also think it's obviously very difficult to enforce, but you have to make it clear because what happens, people come up to you and say, oh, now I have to wear a mask 24 seven, wherever I go. That's not what the ruling is. But the concept of masks, despite people out there saying, you know, that's ridiculous and it's stupid, you know, and, but I, it's become a political issue and it should be, as Tom said, it should be a scientific issue. But clearly, communication, and I think Tom said this before, uh, that communication is important. So what the governor is saying is, listen, when you get close to people, right, put on a mask. But if you're jogging down the street, you don't have to wear a mask. So let's be clear as to what that executive order says, and let's try to make it clear. You know, tr try to be considerate. Actually, I have to tell you, you know those talk, uh, close talkers we used to have? I am so happy about what happens. The only positive effect here in terms of COVID-19, right? People are not in your face, okay? And you know, as you travel, I mean, we should have an executive order when this is all over that close talkers have to stop being close, okay? I would love to see that as well. John, I was laughing just now. You made me think of that Seinfeld episode uh, with the close talker. <laughs> <laughs> I, for years, for years, I had problems on this hugging thing anyway. I didn't know who to hug. Was I friendly enough to hug them? You know, how often did I see you to hug you? Uh, am I really going to kiss you? This is the one good thing is, hey, guess what? Hey, how you doing? <laughs> like, you know, there's no just, you know, that kind of awkward moment where you're moving forward, moving back. Now with the mask, the close talkers are over, right? And the people want to hug you are over, right? Not bad. Not bad. That, might be, that might be a new bit for you as you bring your show back on the road again. Not, not bad. And, you know, these Zoom things, right? No hugging, no kissing, nothing, you know? Social. Listen, I'm going to get one last question in uh, before we hand it over to Tom and Michelle for closing remarks. Um, I'm doing this in honor of our good friend, uh, Nick Accicella, who recently passed. And it's a politics question. We just passed uh, the primary. So to both of you, predictions for the fall. Senator Kane. A lot of people are going to be working very hard. Get out and vote. <laughs> Anybody in particular, Senator Kane? <laughs> this is a state call. I can't talk federal stuff. <laughs> okay. Oh, we can't? Can I talk federal stuff or no? Sure, go ahead, John. <laughs> you asked me a prediction, Tom Kane Jr. Tom Kane Jr. Tom Kane Jr. But if you're talking about a federal election, uh, I, and first of all, Nick Akincello, you know, a lot, a lot of us did pasta in politics, right? There was nobody more warm, 
more sincere, more respectful. You know, there's a few people like that out there. Michael Aaron's one of them. You know, this is the old school where it wasn't personal. They were journalists, and I miss Nick, no question about it. Uh, on the federal level, et cetera, some great expert once told me, you can only predict outcomes two months in advance of an election because the the bottom line is things change so quickly in politics that um, you know it's difficult to make calls as we've seen. So I say, call me two, let's do a Zoom or whatever this is. I forget the name of this one, like, I don't know, call gotowebinar.com or something. Anyway, two months from now, we'll make predictions other than the T. Tom K. Jr. <laughs> Thank you, John. I'm gonna hand it back over to Tom and Michelle for closing remarks. Um, I would just say thank you to both the Assemblyman and the Senator for always candid uh, infra information and unfiltered, and we uh, really appreciate your support over the years, and we're going to need your support more than ever going forward. The future of our state is at risk here, and there's a lot of moving parts that can turn us negative, and we can't let that happen. So thank you very much, and we look forward to working with you going forward. Thank you to you and Michelle and to the organizations, the people on the call. Thank you for having us. Thank you. And echo, echo that yeah. for sure. And you know, every crisis has a silver lining. And uh, in addition to uh, no more, no more hugs and uh, and close talk, right? Uh, there are opportunities staring at us here. And uh, let's not miss, let's not miss this one time to seize those opportunities for a New Jersey that is uh, a lot different on the other side of this. Gentlemen, thanks for your continued support, and everyone, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Thank Michelle. You.